I want to talk about left coronary guiding catheter engagement. I suggest that you review under my playlist cardiac catheterization, which I organized by dates. I suggest that you review my prior talk about left coronary artery engagement, whether from 2022 or 2021. What I will give today will be complementary to that. I will start with an overview, a reminder of the basic steps of radial left coronary engagement in general, which apply for guiding catheter as well as for diagnostic catheters. First, always imagine the left cusp, which is the highest cusp, and the right or non-coronary cusp, which are the lower cusp. Typically, when you advance your wire, it will go onto that right or non-coronary cusp. And this is your base of operation. You first advance a wire all the way to that right cusp and you loop it there. Then over it, you advance your catheter. This is the first step to advance your catheter over that wire in the base of operation in the right cusp. And the way you advance your catheter, it could be just a straight advancement, but frequently you need those two maneuvers, mild, gentle clockwise torque, 10 to 20 degree, not much. I see fellows sometimes torquing too much. It's just a gentle torque as you're pushing it down. And number two, deep breath. In simple cases, you may not even need to do those two things, but those are very helpful in tough cases. So you advance it all the way to the valve and it will look like this. Then the second step is to make it jump from that right cusp all the way to the left cusp. That's the key step, the jump. Now, before you jump, you have to make sure the catheter is flat in front of you. If it is looking at you like it is here, you may need to clock it a little bit, make it flat. Then you pull to make it jump. Also in this, deep breath help you achieve a jump. Sometimes as you're pulling to jump, the catheter flips out and flies up in the aorta. So in those cases, deep breath will help you and torquing slightly the catheter and seeing how it behaves will help. So as you're jumping, you may or may not need to torque. If you torque, see how the catheter is behaving and be ready to immediately reverse your torque as you're jumping. Keep the wire in typically throughout those maneuvers. The wire will give you more torqueability and also it will allow a bailout in case you fail. In case your catheter jumps up, you re-advance the wire into that base of operation and you restart over. This is an illustration of what I was saying here. If your catheter is looking at you, before you jump, make it flat, usually by clocking it. And you can see here how we made it flat by clocking it. Deep breath helps a lot in difficult cases. Difficult cases are characterized by a sharp enominate to aorta junction, as well as by a short aorta. And in those cases, deep breath helps a lot to get your catheter all the way down because otherwise in this sharp angle, if you're trying to advance your catheter over the wire, the catheter may prolapse out. So you need to do deep breath to elongate that aorta, make that angle more straight and easier for the catheter to slip down. And number two, you torque. Like I said, gently, you torque 10 to 20 degrees to get it down. Deep breath and torque, typically clock, also help in that jump. Deep breath makes it easy for that catheter to jump from the right to the left cusp. When you have taken a deep breath, it's easier for the catheter to, to go this way than to preferentially want to jump out and embrace that upward angle. So deep breath is extremely helpful as you're getting down in difficult cases. Now, once you've got to the left cusp after that jump, which was number two, now we have stage three, which is 
to engage the coronary. And there are two types of stage three, 3A three or 3B. Three 3A three means after you get to the left cusp, you just try to pull and engage from above. 3B means after you get to the left cusp, you push to engage from below and hook that coronary from below. Now, if you do 3A, typically you pull, you may pull straight or frequently for the diagnostic Judkins left catheter, it's a slight clock. So you pull with a slight clock. Again, usually gentle 10 to 20 degrees. And again, the most important idea here, as it is when you're jumping with a torque, is to react to what you see and be ready to quickly adjust. So I'm pulling here with a slight clock. If I see my catheter looking this way, I immediately reverse my torque. So you only torque about 10 to 20 degree, and this serves as a test. If you see the catheter going in this direction, you immediately reverse it. Now with the Icari left, like with the Jotkins left, it's typically clock as you're pulling to engage from above. With the EBU type of guide is often counter clock. And I will explain that a little later. And by the way, for the diagnostic catheter, Jotkins left and Tiger, you can try either 3A from above or 3B from below. For the EBU guides from a radial access, it's exclusively engagement from below using the 3B technique. And for the Icari left type of guide catheter, you can try either 3A from above or 3B. This is an illustration uh, of a case. This is a Jotkins left 3.5 and we're trying the 3A maneuver to engage from above. So the coronary is here. Imagine we gave a puff and the left coronary is here. It's above us. And this is how the catheter is. This is a catheter that, that is a little too long for that aorta and coronary. The tip is pointing down and the catheter is elongated up. So one thing you can do here is get a shorter arm Jutkins left to point you into that coronary. So Jutkins left three will get you in the left coronary instead of Jutkins left 3.5. Another thing you can do in this case to engage is try to pull with a clock torque, with a steeper clockwise torque to make it point up. Again, if your clockwise torque makes you look in this direction and makes you want to fly out, you immediately reverse it before you do your fully steep torque. So that's one thing you can try. You can try a shorter arm or you can try the same catheter, JL 3.5, but instead of trying to engage from above, which will be very difficult here because the arm is long, you can just push it and try to engage from below. Pushing allows you to afford a longer arm for engagement. So you push it and you engage from below. And this is what we did here. Now, when you engage from below via pushing, don't do your angiogram with the catheter looking up like this because one, you're not going to fill the coronary well, two, you risk dissecting the ostium of that left main. So what you do after you push and engage from below and hook the ostium, pull slightly as we show here to make it a little more coaxial. So in summary, when you're coming with a Jutkins left and after you jumped, from the right to the left cusp. And you're trying to engage from above and it seems that your catheter is too large for that coronary. You can either try to engage from above by pulling with a steep clock or engage from above using a smaller Jutkins left to make it point up or engage from above using deep inspiration, and I will explain that, or push to engage from below with the same Jutkins left 3.5. So deep inspiration can help with that. It doesn't just help with advancing the catheter 
onto the right cusp in difficult cases or with the jump from right to left cusp, it also helps with engagement from above. And here is how it helps with engagement from above. So when you take a deep breath, you elongate that aorta. That aorta becomes taller and the left coronary itself gets pushed down so much so that that Judkins left that was looking down below the coronary that was too long and looking down below the coronary becomes proper for it and will go into it. And here you see an illustration of a case we did like this. So here the catheter was coming down below the coronary. That was a Judkins left 3.5 below the coronary. So we asked the patient to take a deep breath. Then we advanced with a clock and it went right in. So we told the patient to take a deep breath. We had that aorta, the left main got pushed down. Then we advanced the catheter with a clock. The clock makes the catheter tip points up. So it made us successful. Look again, deep breath. Then we advanced with a clock and we got right into that coronary. Beware that with deep breath, the catheter will be pulled up and may fly out. So as the patient is taking a deep breath, you should be ready to quickly push and advance the catheter. Now in that same patient from the last slide, before we engage successfully from above using deep breath, we tried, knowing that our catheter is too long, we tried to push it and loop it from below, which is an appropriate attempt. So we tried to push and loop it from below and watch here. We pushed and eventually we were able to hook something. Unfortunately, we did not hook the osteum. The catheter tip came here. Imagine this is the cusp. It came just next nearby the true left coronary osteum. So when this happened, what you do, if you insist on still engaging from below, we pull back on that catheter to free it. We give it a torque, either direction. We just give it a torque to move it out of the plane where it landed. And you push again, hoping the tip now will land into the true coronary osteo. Another idea I want to mention about deep breath. It elongates the aorta, makes it more vertical and push the left main down. But that's also helpful in case of separate ostia. When you don't have left main, you have LAD and left circumflex separate ostia. And let's say your catheter is going into the left circumflex and you want to direct it to the LAD. If you take a deep breath here, you will elongate the aorta and you will push both the LAD and left circumflex down. So the LAD is now more downward, so much so that that catheter that was pointing down on the circ now will be pointing down into the LAD instead. So deep breath makes you go from left circumflex to LAD in separate ostia. Conversely, if the catheter is in the LAD and you want it to go in the left circumflex, make the patient exhale deeply and hold his breath after expiration. In this case, after expiration, the left circumflex will be pushed up. And so the catheter that was in the LAD will go into the circumflex, which is now more up. So expiration to get in the circumflex, inspiration to get in the LAD. I will move on now to start talking about the coronary, left coronary guiding catheters. And I will focus mainly on the EBU, XB, CLS type of guides, which are kind of similar, those three names, and on the ICARI left. So this is the EBU type of catheter. It has a long platform that sits on the opposite aorta and sometimes on the aortic valve, and it has a long, somewhat straight tip. It's a little different from the Jotkin's left, 
which doesn't have a long platform on the aorta. And look here, this is the Judkins left. This is the EBU or CLS4. So the CLS and EBU4 have a longer platform that sits on the opposite aorta or the aortic valve. And it, ha it has a long tip without bend or with minimal bend. The CLS has a minimal bend. The uh, EBU does not have a bend. Whereas the Jotkin's left has a sharp bend at, at the tip. That long bend with the EBU and CLS provides more support and allows you to go deep in the coronary. So support from that platform and support from being deep with a long, stiff, deep tip. Now you can use EBU 3.5, engage from above, or you can engage it from below, the 3B type of engagement. And when you engage from below, you may or may not need a longer tip. This way you allow it to sit on both the aorta and the aortic valve. You get more support by sitting from below and you may or may not need a longer arm. This is Icari left. Now Icari left has an even a longer platform compared to the uh, Judkins left to sit on the opposite aorta. It also has a bend that is designed to sit in the innominate aorta sharp angulation. So it's designed for right radial. It makes the catheter less likely to prolapse out into the arch. And it has a tip that is not as sharp as the Jotkins, but it has a tip, unlike the EBU and CLS, which have minimal to no distal tip. So it tends to point more upward than the CLS and EBU type of guiding catheters, okay? Now, Icari left, what makes it different from the EBU and CLS is one that extra slight tip at the end, but that's not the most important thing. It is more slippery, more hydrophilic, and it's a lighter catheter. It is also dimpled. It has dimple on its surface. All those make it more slippery and easier to maneuver and easier to engage from a radial axis, beside the fact that it has that bend in the innominate. So it's much easier to handle than CLS EBU guiding catheter. However, because it's lighter and more slippery, it doesn't provide as much support. It's not as heavy of a catheter. So it's not as supportive. So much so that if you use Icari left, you absolutely have to be engaged from below. You have to be sitting on that aortic valve and the opposite aorta. So you have to get engaged from below to obtain proper support. That's why I rarely use Icari left 3.5. I tend to use the longer arms 4 and 4.5, and looped and engaged from below. Now, what sizing do we use in general? So I mentioned with Icari left, I use 4, 4.5. How about with EBU? Now, for EBU, the general wisdom is that with the EBU CLS type of catheter, they are more downward looking than the Jutkins left because the Jutkins left has that extra tip, which those don't have. So they are more downward looking than the Jutkins left. So in order to point in that coronary, if you engage it with a Jutkins left four, you need an EBU 3.5 to engage that coronary. So we need a shorter arm EBU to have the same upward pointing as, as the Jutkins left. So generally speaking, for from ephemeral, if we use a Jutkins left four, the standard size, we're going to use EBU 3.5 for a normal size aorta. For a large aorta, we use a larger Jutkins left and we use usually EBU four for aorta over four centimeters. For a smaller aorta, a three centimeters or less, we use EBU three. This general wisdom about sizing applies from ephemeral axis. However, it's different from a radial axis. From a radial axis, I use the same size EBU as the Jutkins left. So if I'm using Jutkins left 3.5 to engage, 
I would use EBU 3.5, which ends up being the same size EBU that we use to engage from femoral. So diagnostically from femoral, I use a GL4 and from radial, I use a GL 3.5, but guide ding catheter wise, I use EBU 3.5 from femoral and I use EBU 3.5 from radial. And why is that? Because from radial, you need a lot more support than you need from femoral, which femoral is inherently more supportive. So we need more support with your guiding catheter when you're go going radially. From femoral access, EBU 3.5 is often enough and it gives you enough support by being deep coaxial and by sitting on the opposite aortic wall without deeply abutting it. From radial, you need to sit tightly against that opposite aortic wall. You need to be tightly stuck against that opposite aortic wall. And you often need to be close to that aortic valve. For those reasons, I use EBU 3.5 from radial, like I use EBU 3.5 from femoral. And that same EBU size will be more elongated and stuck and more supportive from radial. We don't shorten EBU from radial, unlike what we do with the Judkins left. And I may even use a longer EBU from radial, again, to be more stuck and to get more support. Using a shorter EBU 3 may be easier to maneuver as it is less bulky and it will not feel as stuck. And it is more upward pointing, which may make it easier to maneuver, but it will not give you good support. In fact, I may use a longer EBU 3.75 to 4 from radial, even longer than what I would use from femoral to engage from below from a radial axis and be more stuck on the aortic valve and to get deeper support in the coronary. So I use that longer EBU from radial, even longer from than uh, femoral in the following four cases. One, I need more support, so I need to engage from deep below and or get deep engagement for a long left main. This is more often needed for radial than femoral to improve support. Or if I have large aorta close to four centimeter, I would use EBU4. That idea would apply for femoral axis as well. The third reason I would use a big uh, EBU uh, radially is if you want to go selectively in a left circumflex in a short left main, you need a longer arm to point you down toward the left circumflex than if you need to selectively engage LAD. A fourth reason I would use a longer EBU radially is if the left main has inferior takeoff, I need a longer curve to point me down into the inferior takeoff. And note that when you have a longer arm and you're stuck engaged from below with good support, you can also pull a little bit on it and your guide tip will dive deeper and it will provide you deep coaxial support. That's particularly useful in patient with a long left main. And that's why in those patients with long left main where you need more support, a longer EBU is helpful. And that's why in cases where you have long left main and you're trying to maneuver into the circumflex, it's good to get a long EBU to get deep engagement and attenuate somewhat the length of that, that left main into the left circumflex. Also, if you have a short left main, that long tip catheter is helpful if you want to maneuver the circumflex simply because the catheter itself will tend to point into that left, left circumflex. This is an illustration. This is an XB 3.5. This is how it is engaged. If you get XB 4, you can get more robust engagement stuck against the aortic valve and the opposite aorta. Or you can get that XB 4 to point more down in case of a downward looking left main or in case of short left main with a circumflex and you want to point into that circumflex. Now, I carry left, like I said, because it's not supportive, you have to get a longer I carry left and engage it from below. 
the 3B technique. Actually, for the Aikari left, you can engage it from above or from below. But even if you engage it from above, you have to always push it in a power position and make it look like this. So even when you engage the Aikari left from above, push it and loop it from below in a U fashion. So it looks as if you've engaged it from below. You need to do that to get support with an Aikari left and use a longer arm than you do with EBU typically. So this is a summary slides of all the sizes I would use. So for diagnostic, Jutkins left 3.5 from radial, Jutkins left four from femoral. For EBU, it's the 3.5 from radial, engage from above, 3.5 from femoral. For EBU, you can use a 3.75 to 4 from radial, especially if you're trying to get more support, whether deep engagement in the left main, long left main, or short left main, and you're maneuvering into the circumflex, or you want to get deep support from below. And for I carry left, you should always use bigger sizes because you have to engage from below and get the support from below. So I often use, I carry left four to 4.5 or CLS EBU 3.5 to 3.75 from radial or CLS EBU 3.75 to four longer sizes if I need more support or if large aorta or left main has inferior takeoff or frequently for left circumflex. And I use CLS EBU 3.5 to 3.75 from femoral. Now, after I explained what sizes and the rationale, how do we engage EBU CLS from a radial axis? Now, the first steps are the same as with diagnostic catheter, the same step one and step two, the jump, and the same 3A and 3B, but, the, but there are some modifications. One, the jump. The jump with the EBU and CLS guiding catheter is not as easy as it is with the Jutkins and Icari catheter. This is because the catheter is more down pointing, more straight down, less easy to jump up toward the left cusp. So the jump may be hard and in order to jump, you usually need deep breath. So use that deep breath more routinely with a EBU as you're jumping. So you need deep breath and frequently clock. But again, be ready to reverse. If you with a clock, as you're trying to jump, you're clocking and the catheter is turning toward the other direction, be ready to immediately reverse that torque. So the jump may be hard and often use deep breath to help you. And again, more importantly, react to what you see. If your catheter is about to fly out, quickly reverse your torque. Try 10 to 20 degree gentle torque in one direction, usually clock for that jump and watch the catheter behavior and be ready to immediately reverse. Now, this is the jump. Now, how about stage three? which is engaging the coronary from above or from below. There are modifications for the EBU-CLS catheter. And this is how we engage in the stage three. It's normally we don't engage from above. So usually we use from below and there is another technique that I will describe. So 3A, which is the engagement from above, with the EBU-CLS does not work. If you try to pull and torque to engage, it usually does not work. Those catheters are too bulky and too stuck in that aorta and over the cusp and too down pointing from a radial axis that it's not easy to pull and direct them in the coronary ostium. That technique works from a femoral EBU-CLS. It does not work usually from radial. So what the way you do uh, EBU-CLS from radial is you have to do it from below, the 3B. Even to have that shape, you have to start by looping it from below, engage, then pull it to have it on the opposite aorta. So this is how we do it with EBU. 
Well, after you jump in the left cusp, you push and form a U shape. And then if you need to, you can pull to make it look like engage from above, but you always engage from below, then you can pull it to make it adjust on the opposite aorta, not, not on the aortic valve. Okay, so the technique is always to push from below. Now you push with a torque and typically you push and as you're forming that U shape, you push with a slight counter clock. This is unlike Judkins and Ikari where often clock works best. And why is that? Partly because as you're going down with the Judkins and Ikari, it's easier to go down and to jump with the Judkins and Ikari. So you don't clock as much as you clock with the EBU CLS. So for those reasons with the EBU and CLS, you clock more going down. So it really depends on how much you clocked here so much than when you want to engage the coronary, you need to counter clock a little bit. Counter clock all that clock that you've thought getting to that point. So that's one reason why you counter clock with it. Another reason is that Judkins and Akari have two bands. They have a band here, but they also have a band at the tip, which make the torque transmit differently. But most importantly, what I want you to know, do not obsess over counter clock or clock here. For those steps, getting down and until the jump, it's usually clock, memorize that. But for the engagement, those was a 3A, 3B. It's usually counterclock, but there is no general rule. It really depends also on how much clock you've put coming down. So don't obsess with it. The most important thing is that you try one maneuver. And if you're counterclocking and pushing and you see the catheter turning away, just immediately reverse it. So the most important idea here is that you try one torquing maneuver as you're pushing. If your catheter is going away, you reverse it. Another idea that's interesting about pushing from below is that you don't even need to jump. If you've had hard time jumping in difficult cases with very sharp angulation and short aorta, you haven't been able to jump from the right to left cusp. Each time you try to jump, your catheter fly out. Well, one try deep breath to jump. But even if you're not able to jump to the left cusp with all, with all maneuvers and deep breath, you can try to push and loop from below from the right cusp. That may occasionally work. Now some troubleshooting about that 3B technique, engaging from below. Let's say you push to engage from below, but the catheter tip gets stuck below the ostium. You haven't been able to reach up. So what do you do in this case? Well, pull the catheter a little bit to free that tip, then push again with a steeper or different torque, maybe clock instead of counter clock or a steeper counter clock, okay? So give it a different orientation. Or you can pull again to free the tip, then try to push with deep breath. Keep in mind, deep breath is extremely helpful in guide engagement, particularly guide engagement, from a radial in all the steps, whether coming down to the right cusp, jumping to the left cusp, and engaging the coronary. Deep breath is very helpful. So if you get stuck, you may think of getting a shorter catheter and that may work, but I prefer that you keep that longer tip catheter for support and you just do those maneuver that I explained, deep breath or pull and re-push with more torque. Another a troubleshooting idea, if after you push, the catheter reaches the level of the coronary, but it's in a little bit of an outer plane, like the diagnostic case I showed earlier. What do you do in this case? Well, in this case, you can, again, pull the catheter to straighten it a little, give it a different torque or more torque, then push it and hope it will get into the ostium. Sometimes, even in this position, if it doesn't feel stuck without having to pull and try over, you can try to torque while it's in this position to hook the ostium if it is not stuck. But if it is stuck, you pull it, 
elongate it and free it, give it a torque and push again. So all those were engaging from below, the so-called 3B technique. There is another technique, 3C, that works for that EBU type of guiding catheters. So what it is, it means you push the guiding catheter, whether you're in the left cusp or even in the right cusp, you push it to loop it on itself, whether it loops on itself accidentally or you push it on purpose to loop it on itself. And once it loops on itself, like this, you advance the wire and that wire will make the catheter tip look down and it will make you engage. It will straighten it and make it engage. That's a very helpful maneuver. And this is particularly helpful in cases where the catheter keeps looping itself or you're not able to jump or you have a high left coronary takeoff. Keep in mind that throughout all those maneuvers that we're doing here, I'm keeping the wire in the catheter anyway throughout all the technique, not out of the tip, but inside it to give me more torqueability and to bail me out should the catheter loops on itself. And I can use it here to my favor to engage. Now, how about EBU CLS engagement from a femoral axis? You can use those same technique, 3B, pushing it and looping it from below, and uh, 3C, looping it on itself, then straightening it with a wire. The only difference when you're using those from femoral is that more often it's a clock rather than counter clock. Again, don't obsess with that, but it's more often clock. One of the reasons is that you're not having to navigate the enominate into the ascending aorta using a lot of clock torque before getting to the left cusp. So you're not storing a lot of clockwise torque. In addition, you can use the 3A direct engagement from above from femoral. So that doesn't work usually from radial, but it works from femoral where you get your catheter on the left cusp, then you pull it with a clock and you get right in. And it's usually quite easy from a femoral axis. You can also use a slightly different technique, what I call 3D, which is the fourth a guiding catheter engagement technique where you advance your wire onto the valve and you advance the EBU catheter and you don't make it touch the valve. You keep it about one to two centimeter above the cusp at a level almost close to the level of the left coronary osseum. Then you pull the wire and you clock the catheter, it goes right in. So this way we're engaging directly from above without having to start at the valve level. So you don't even start here, then pull and clock. You just start higher up. You keep the catheter higher up. You pull the wire out and you clock and it goes right in. This is a very successful maneuver. Those 3A and 3D are the most successful from ephemeral access, whereas 3B and 3C are usually necessary from a radial axis. Now I will move on to describe how to engage I carry left. I already explained I carry left. You can do 3A basically after you jump to the left cusp, you can pull usually with a clockwise torque and engage, or you can push usually with clockwise torque to engage. You catch the ostium. That's what we call the loop or the U technique. The important thing for I carry left, even when you engage from above, you don't want to keep it engaged like this. Like I said, it gives very poor support. So you have to push it to make it U shape and looped from, from below, even if you engage it from, from above. It's kind of the opposite of the EBU kind of catheter. Where I explain that when you engage it from below, you don't need to keep it engaged from below. You can actually pull it and make it look from above. That's completely opposite with the Aikari, where even if you engage from above, you have to push it to make it look engaged from below. So totally different dynamics. I want to show you some cases. This is a CLS 3.5. We took deep breath 
and the clockwise torque to get it into the left cusp. Then in the left cusp, we pushed with a little bit of counterclock. We hooked it here. It was looking way up. So we end up pulling it and make it look like this, coaxial on the opposite wall of the aorta. So we engage from below, then we pulled, we make it coaxial and deep in the coronary opposed to the aorta as if it was engaged from above. This is a case of a CLS4. We did not see it jump, but we were not sure, are we still in the right cusp or we're in the left cusp? Whenever you're not sure, use a puff. And here is what the puff shows us. So when you give a puff and you see that ridge, that nest with a ridge on the side and you don't see the left coronary, this is the right cusp. This is not the left cusp. So we were still stuck on that ridge. We need to jump up. So we jumped up in this patient using deep breath and counterclock. Clock did not work. So counterclock and deep breath got us there. Then we pushed to engage from below. We came a little bit below the ostium. So what we did, we pulled gently. We pulled. And at that point, you see how it got free. So we pulled, the catheter got free, the catheter tip got free. Then we pushed again with a counterclock and got deep into the coronary. So we engaged using a looping maneuver and we kept it looped in this case from below to get the extra support, especially that that was an EBU4, very proper to stay engaged from below abutted on the opposite aorta and the aortic valve. This is another case. This is a case of CLS4. We get it to go to the left cusp and we are trying to push from the left cusp to engage from below, but it feels stuck. We're not able to advance it anymore. And you can see here, it is stuck. We cannot push it anymore. So what do we do in this case? We pull slightly to free the tip. We give it a slight torque, then we push it again. And eventually it hooked the coronary. You see how it's hooking the coronary here. And it is nice, it's CLS4, it's a long tip. So what we could do here, we can either keep it engaged while it's sitting on the opposite aorta and the aortic valve, or we can pull it a little bit and make it deeply engaged on the coronary and give us good support from deep and coaxial engagement. This is another case. This is CLS 3.5. Initially, we were struggling in the right cusp. It was hard for us to get out of it. And notice with some torque, the catheter was about to fly out. So we immediately reversed the torque. We immediately reverse it. That's an important skill. So eventually with deep breath, torque, here what worked was counterclock, and pull, we got it to jump to the left cusp. And again, we reverse torque here. We got it to jump to the left cusp. Here it jumped. Then we pushed it. And we engaged successfully from below. You can watch here the moment of the jump. We had to use, in order to jump here, we had to use deep breath, pull, and actually what worked here is counterclock. Again, you react to what you see. And how do you know your right versus left cusp? You have to always imagine it in your brain, the lower cusp and the upper cusp. The upper cusp is the left cusp. The lower cusp is the right or non-coronary cusp. And when you jump to the left cusp, you will see a jump. You will see an abrupt movement. Also with puffs. So if you're confused and you don't know, give a puff. If the puff shows you a ridge like here, that means you're in the right cusp. If the puff shows you the left coronary, then you know you're in the left cusp. So remember very well that image. 
you see the ridge, you're in the right cusp. This is another case where we got from right to left cusp with a clock and pull. And again, we reacted to what we saw. We saw the catheter jump out during one maneuver. We immediately reverse it. Be ready to quickly reverse your torque. Then after we get to the left cusp, we pushed with a counter clock. This was CLS 3.5 and a JL 3.5 was used for diagnostic. This is CLS 4. We are in the left cusp here. We try to engage from above, which is a bad idea. It's a long CLS and it usually doesn't work to engage from above from a radial axis. So bad idea, the cathode was about to fly out. So we torqued it back again, counter clock, and we pushed it and engage it from below. And you can see how it went in successfully. Here you can see how it went in successfully by pushing it from below. If that had not worked, you could have looped it on itself on purpose, then advance the wire to straighten the tip and make it go into the coronary. This is another CLS engagement. You can see here it's coming down right cusp, then we looped it here on itself from the right cusp. We looped on itself, we never jumped, looped, looped it on itself. Then we advanced it all the way down, advanced the wire to straighten it and it went right in. So this is the beauty, that technique where you make it loop on itself and advance the wire to straighten it may be used from the right cusp. So you don't need to jump with this technique and that is handy in difficult cases. This is again, the illustration of that. We loop it on itself, whether from right or left cusp, then you advance the wire to straighten and engage. This is another case, CLS3 going down with a clockwise torque. We got to the left cusp with a clockwise torque. Then we pushed here, it looped on itself, then we advanced the wire, it went right straight into the coronary. This is an illustration of an Icari left engagement. Here we, this is the Icari left four. We uh, tried to engage here from above by pulling the catheter with a clock, it didn't work. So we pushed and we were able to engage from below. This is another case of an Icari left in a patient with short and sharply angled aorta. So we went with an Icari left 3.5 here down to the right cusp. We tried to loop it from the right cusp. In difficult cases, like I said, you can try to loop from the right cusp and engage the left coronary from the right cusp. It didn't work, however. So look at it tried to push, it didn't work. So we pulled back, clock with a deep breath. We were able to jump to the left cusp, as you will see here, it jumped to the left cusp. Then we pushed it to engage from below. However, it didn't engage. It came in a different plane. In that same case, the catheter, we pushed it from below, but it was out of the plane of the coronary. So what we did, we stayed on the left cusp, we pulled a little bit, we gave the catheter a torque to make it look in a different direction. Then we pushed it again and we successfully engaged it. Another idea about left coronary guide, I elaborated about the EBU CLS type of guides and the ICARI left guide. However, don't forget about the Amplatz left option, which I explained last, last time. It's a great for the right coronary. It's also great for the left coronary. For a normal size aorta, I would use AL2. For a large aorta, larger than uh, 4, 4.5 centimeter, I would use AL3. And for the right coronary, I would use AL1. Keep in mind one idea uh, for AL. Unlike the other catheter, the longer the AL, the bigger the duct, of that AL and the more it will point up. 
Whereas with the other catheter, XB, EBU, Jutkins left, the longer that arm, the more it points down. With the amplats left, the longer that arm, the bigger the duct ends up being and the more you point up. Just so you know. For example, if I want to do a complex intervention on a left circumflex in a patient with a short left main, I may use amplats left 1.5, a shorter amplats left, so it points me toward that left circumflex and gives me support. Amplats left two for LAD in a patient with a short left main or no left main. Amplats left 1.5 for the circumflex in a short left main or no left main. And I will give one more idea. I cannot finish my talk without talking about separate LAD left circumflex ostia and how to move from one artery to the other. So let's say I have separate LAD left circumflex ostia and my catheter Jutkins left 3.5 is in the left circumflex. How do I move it into the LAD? And those ideas apply for diagnostic as well as for guiding catheter. So one, you can get a shorter catheter to make it point up since the LED is more upward looking, so JL3, or if you're using EBU 3.5, you can use EBU 3. That's one idea. Another idea is this JL 3.5 that's in the circ, you pull it to disengage it, then you try to engage from below. So you pull it to disengage it, then you push and try to loop from below to engage and point up in the LED. Those are the two most important maneuvers. But there are, in fact, five different techniques to go from the left circumflex to the LAD. The one and simplest and most important idea is that you switch to a smaller catheter. So if you're a GL 3.5, GL 3, EBU 3.5, EBU 3, this will point you more up. The second idea is you slightly disengage then you advance the catheter. After you disengage, you advance the catheter to the valve. Then you push the catheter to engage from below. The third idea is you slightly disengage and you engage again from above, but using a different orientation. So you slightly disengage to get out of the coronary and you counterclock then you re-engage. Now, counterclock may point you in the LAD. Why? Because counterclock for a Jutkins that has a hinge on the aorta will point the catheter more anteriorly, unlike the Jutkins right, where a clock will point it more anteriorly. But Jutkins left, if it has a deep hinge on the aorta, counterclock will point it more anteriorly. Conversely, you can disengage, get out of the coronary, and clock then re-advance, you may get in the LED. So clock may get you in the LED if that Jutkins left doesn't have a hinge on the aorta, then it becomes like the Jutkins right. Clock will make it look more anterior. Or clock may work because clock always points the catheter tip upward. So clock may work because it points the catheter tip upward. So either or works. So what I do in those cases, you, I disengage, get out of the coronary, then if I see that the aorta is small and I have a good hinge on the aorta, I counterclock and re-advance to get in the LED. Or if I don't have a big hinge, I clock and re-advance in the LED. And if one doesn't work, I try the other one. Another and very important maneuver I described earlier is deep breath. So again here, you disengage from the left circumflex. Then you ask the patient to take a deep breath and keep it in and you re-advance your catheter with a clock or counterclock, and you frequently get right in. Frequently for that, I usually do clock. I re-advance with a clock maneuver. And the fifth technique is to try amplats left, two, as it points up, okay? Now to go from LED to left circumflex, it's the opposite. You switch to a larger catheter or if you're engaged from below, you disengage, 
and you try to engage from above, which will pull the catheter more down in the left circumflex. Or what you can do, you can slightly disengage, then clock or counter clock to get into that left circumflex. As I explained, it depends on whether the catheter has a hinge on the aorta, but you can try either or. There is no definite rule here. The other technique is deep exhalation. So you disengage, the ask, you ask the patient to exhale and keep his breath out. Then you re-advance with a counter clock and often you will get into that circumflex or you can try AL1 or AL1.5 as short AL points down on the left. Again, this is how respiration, deep inspiration pushes the coronary down. So the LED which was up now becomes down. So JL3.5, if it was in the circ, now you take deep breath, that JL3.5 will now go in the LAD. Conversely, if that JL3.5 is in the LAD, you exhale, you make that left circumflex up with exhalation, then the JL3.5 will go into the left circumflex.